Chris Mannix from The Vertical, host of The Chris Mannix Show, weekday afternoons on NBC Sports Radio, the 24-hour sports talk network. Download the app and subscribe to The Mannix Podcast. So much to get into. Chris, how are you, pal? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good, and I, I want to start off with uh, you were in Boston the other night and uh, the outer body experience that uh, it's seen that Isaiah Thomas is having right now. We know what's all going on with him and the sister, and uh, he's just having an unbelievable roller coaster ride of emotions, i got to imagine. But what was it like uh, watching that game and seeing what he brought to the table that night? It was uh, being in Philly. That was Allen Iverson S there, just took that game over all by himself. Well, it was surreal. Um, you know, I mean, the the game on Sunday that he played, scoring 33 points, nine assists. I mean, I thought that was incredible because he did it less than 24 hours after burying his sister. I mean, he was on a flight from Tacoma, Washington, late at night. Didn't get in till 3 a.m. The game was at 12:30. Uh, I, I thought I'd seen the best of Isaiah Thomas there, and then he comes back out. You know, his heart's still heavy. Um, and missing a couple of teeth or at least one tooth and some massive dental work needed uh, and goes out and has 50 plus. I mean, this guy's having, he's authoring one of the more remarkable postseason stories that I've ever seen. And, and he's doing it with facing such overwhelming adversity and just beating it back. I mean, he is, this is just an incredible, incredible story for Isaiah Thomas. It really is. Uh, has he elevated himself to another level? I mean, I think when people came into this series, Chris, they thought, okay, great story, guy scores, uh, but in playoffs, you know, uh, you know, defensively still a liability out there. But has this series changed the perception of Isaiah? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly has. I mean, you know, I, playoffs is where legacies are made, and Isaiah knows this. He's said this publicly a couple of times. Uh, and, and, you know, the, this is where being a great regular season scorer uh, can be meaningless. Now, he's still, you know, not going to morph into a great defensive player. I mean, he's not defending much of John Wall or Bradley Beal. Brad Stevens has tried to hide him on Otto Porter and Kelly Oubre uh, during this series, but uh, it's well worth it for what you're getting on the offensive end of the floor. And, you know, look, what's most remarkable about what he's doing offensively is that he's really pulled Boston's fat out of the fire. I mean, game one, they were down 17. Game two, they were down double digits. He has led both these comebacks, and, and he's done it with everybody on the other side knowing he's getting the ball and he's getting the shots. I mean, it, it really is something to watch where a team knows uh, Boston's going to go to Isaiah Thomas, but they've been, they're able to do almost nothing to stop him. I mean, I was I was talking to Tommy Heinsohn after the game, and you know, Tommy, who has you know played with Bill Russell, uh, you know, coached John Havlicek, broadcast all the games for Larry Bird. He told me that that 50-plus point per, uh, per game, uh, performance by Isaiah Thomas was the best he's ever seen. Wow. And that says something coming from a guy <laughs> that's seen every Celtic great moment. Uh, they play tonight, game three. Uh, Chris Mannix in the verticals with us. Uh, Chris, uh, on the other side, what is uh, the, the, the John Wall story here? Because so much was made about this Washington team, and Wall was jumping into that next. He had a great game, but uh, no points in overtime, a lot of bad shots. Uh, it just, it just uh, He doesn't have enough. Uh, what do you make of Wall and the Wizards? Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't put any of this on Wall, really. Um, you know, he's gotten off to incredible starts. I mean, 19 points in the first quarter. I think it was six assists uh, as well. But he's not getting any help. Uh, Brandon Jennings, who's supposed to be giving him a break off the bench, has offered nothing. And it's to the point where Brad, uh, where, sorry, uh, Scott Brooks has had to go back to Wall a little bit early, and that's cost him uh, in the postseason, in, uh, in late in the games. And Bradley Beal, another guy who's given them nothing, at least not in game two. Uh, you know, for them. He can't do it all by himself. Uh, you know, Wall's not not that type of player. He's a driving kick type of player. When his guys aren't making shots, um, it, it cripples that team. So I think John's been one of the few shining lights uh, for this team. Should he have made a couple of those shots in overtime? Absolutely. But he's not getting any kind of help, and he's not getting anywhere near the help, I think, that Isaiah's gotten in these first two games. Game three tonight for those two. Uh, I want to look back at last night and get your take on, I mean, everybody thought it was Spurs, Warriors, Parker going out, what does that do to the Western Conference playoff now? I mean, it wasn't uh, – uh, most people thought Golden State anyway, but now? Yeah, it looks like he's done for the postseason too. I mean, that's um, you know, that's crippling uh, for the Spurs. I mean, I've been saying all season long, wait for playoff Tony Parker. I mean, this is what San Antonio does. They taper the minutes of their stars, and then they ramp them back up. They're just like a, an old car getting started really late, and, and that's what, what Parker became. He was great in the Memphis series – and he was very good uh, when he was playing in game two. 
with him out, you know, both mentally and, and schematically, I just don't know how San Antonio survives this. I mean, he had averaged about 16 points per game uh, in the postseason. I just don't think you can make that up with the combination of Patty Mills and some other guys off the bench. Now, the Spurs won't quit, but, you know, when, when, you're, when, when you're facing a team that's as good as Houston and even eventually a team that's as good as Golden State, your margin for error is almost paper thin. And, and losing Parker, I think, explodes that margin. Uh, enough that uh, you think they can get clipped here by the Rockets? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think Houston's a flawed team. You know, they're they're entirely reliant on three point shooting. If they're not making three point shots, um, they can shoot their way out of games defensively. They're nowhere near as good as San Antonio. But you know, no Parker. I you know you you listen to the quotes, and I wasn't at that game last night. But if you listen to the quotes and read the quotes from players in the locker room. The mere sight of, of the face of their franchise, one of the faces of their franchise anyway, uh, Tony Parker being carried off the floor, uh, dealing with that type of pain in the locker room. Uh, I, I just don't know how you bounce back from that. Uh, Chris Maddox with us here for The Vertical and, of course, uh, NBC Sports Radio. Uh, is this the best LeBron we've seen? Uh, I know he's been unbelievable in years past, but 39. Now we're seeing a scoring LeBron. I mean, now it's like a LeBron just uh, toying with guys LeBron. Yeah, this is just a, a reminder from LeBron <laughs> that he is still the best player on the planet. Um, you know, he might just bide his time in the regular season. And, and look, it's also a message to, to everybody out there, analysts like myself included, that, you know, suggesting that Cleveland can't flip a switch is just dumb. I mean, they've they've done it for each of the last three postseasons. They've erased any question marks that have been about their team and have gone out and played extremely well, just steamrolled uh, through the Eastern Conference. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, the, 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 the first year that these guys were together, you know, they still won a couple of games from Golden State despite being decimated uh, by injuries to Love and Irving. They go out and they come back and they win a championship last year. I mean, this team, yeah, yeah, they, they treat the regular season, you know, with indifference, and that's being charitable. But when they get <laughs> to the playoffs, they are just impossible to stop. And, and look, I, I thought Toronto had a, a much better than a puncher's chance to – to win this series, but the way the Raptors have been completely unable to defend the three-point line, and now with Kyle Lowry's injury, uh, I, I just have a hard time seeing Toronto finding a way back in it. All right, uh, Chris, uh, tonight it's Utah-Golden State. Uh, does Utah's contrast of styles give Golden State any issues in this series? No, it doesn't. I mean, Utah already had – Utah won their championship. They beat the Clippers. Um, you know, getting – past the first round is an outstanding accomplishment for a team that was outside of the playoffs looking in uh, last year. They're a young team. The core of this team, Hayward, Gobert, uh, and others, you know, they're they're still not in their prime at this point. And, and they're a team that'll be back. And I think if you look at the teams in the future that could be a force to be reckoned with um, once the Golden State era kind of subsides, I think that the Jazz have a great, uh, a great possibility of being that team. But they're just in over their heads. I mean, if you watch the way that the Warriors – are locking down on Joe Johnson and Gordon Hayward. Uh, just so many things have to go right for the Jazz to win this series. Their style, it, it certainly is different than what the uh, the Warriors play, and Rudy Gobert creates a real obstacle for them in the middle. But when, when the Warriors can just shoot your way you know, completely out of games, uh, it, it's hard to, to see a path for the Jazz to win. Uh, Chris Maddox, everybody. And uh, real quick, Chris, of course, covers boxing at uh, the Vertical Yahoo, uh, Basketball Vertical Yahoo, covers the basketball NBC sports. Uh, the heavyweight, we saw a little rebirth. Uh, Joshua, there's a personality for us. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, you know, I think Anthony Joshua, 27 years old, has a chance to be the next major superstar uh, in this sport. And Americans have embraced international heavyweights before. Lennox Lewis was extraordinarily popular here. Uh, when he was fighting, and I think Anthony Joshua can be the exact same way. There, for the first time in a while, there are opponents out there for him. There's mm. Klitschko in a rematch. There's Deontay Wilder. There's Joseph Parker. All these guys can fight, and not just fight once. They can do it two, three times. Uh, create rivalries. Um, I that and I, I wrote this after the fact, but I think Joshua's win really signified a rebirth of the heavyweight division. Uh, he was fun. It was fun. Chris, uh, check him out over at Chris Mannix YS on Twitter for the uh, podcast and everything on boxing, NBA, and NBC Sports Radio. Thanks, Chris. You got it, Mike. Chris Mannix from The Vertical and NBC Sports Radio. Check him out. Host of The Chris Mannix Show weekday afternoons on NBC Sports Radio.